We're continuing our study this summer in 1 Timothy, and we will probably be concluding our study in 1 Timothy here in a week or two, depending on how I decide to address it. So we find ourselves in the final chapter of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, and I want to start with uh, reminding you of the cross. Now, we're in church, so I imagine most of us, if not all of us, have heard of the cross. Jesus died on the cross voluntarily to atone for our sin. His blood was shed that our a sin could be fa- paid for, that we could receive forgiveness of sin by trusting in what he did on the cross. I want to remind us, though, that the cross, what Jesus did on the cross... Maybe hard to understand, or how I say it is hard to understand. I'm not insulting your intelligence this morning. Jesus' work on the cross was relationally based, not task based. Relation nail and left on as a function of a, as a function of a relationship. That is the relationship between Jesus and the Father. So Jesus, out of love for the Father, was completely obedient to the Father through his entire a life on earth. Jesus, out of obedience to the Father, was obedient even to the point of being nailed to a cross. Jesus, in relationship on the cross, experienced separation from the Father. Do you remember that? When the darkness came over the land and Jesus cried out. What did he cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That sounds like something going on in the relationship, doesn't it? There's something happening in the relationship that's critically and significantly important to the redemption that Jesus was purchasing for us. And that is he was voluntarily submitting to separation from the Father so that we would not have to be separated from the Father. So the work of the cross was based on relationship. It was done within the relationship of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And why does this matter? Because everything that God does is a function of relationship. Relationship within the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything that God does is a function of who He is, which is God functioning in relationship with Himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that means that He is not simply asking us to imitate Him as though He were a good example to follow. He is demonstrating to us that the pattern for life in him is relationship the way he does relationship. So God's relationship with himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is not some sort of ideal we're shooting for. He is saying this is the pattern that all human relationships between other humans and between humans and God should function. God is is not just an ideal. He is a pattern to reject the pattern of knowing God in relationship is in fact... To reject God himself. To reject God's pattern of how we know him and how we know one another is to, in fact, reject God himself. In fact, it would be considered dangerous. Do you think it might be dangerous to reject God? The answer to that question is yes. It is dangerous to reject God. It results in your death. And not just your death here, that's bad, but it's not as bad as your eternal death. To reject God and to say, I don't need him or his pattern of life and relationship is to reject him and to be separated from him is terribly dangerous. And and so the passage this morning, 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 10, is a warning passage. It's a warning passage of grave dangers, grave dangers that are faced by the church that he was writing to and grave dangers that are faced by us. And he outlines these grave dangers. And It's fun when we can be in heartwarming, skip through the tulips, Bible passages. Every now and then, though, we need to dive deep into these grave warning passages, and that's what this passage is. We will find great joy in it, though, so I don't want you to think this is going to be too depressing. Just a little. Just a little depressing sprinkled on top. So you'll be fine. Grave dangers. What's the first danger? Let me tell you. The first danger is slandering God. First danger, verses 1 through 2, slandering God. Look with me again at verse 1. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be what? Slander. There is something that could happen 
within the relationships of the believers in this church that could actually result in the name of God being slandered. And what is slander? Simply saying something bad about someone that's not true. So the name of God that could be, could be slandered because of the function of the relationships within the church. And we discover something here in 1 Timothy 6.1 that's extraordinarily shocking. What's shocking about this verse? What's shocking about this verse is that Paul doesn't repudiate slavery. Now some of you read a passage like this and you're offended. What Paul should have written is, masters, flee, free your slaves. Slaves, slavery is unjust, flee from your masters. Slavery shouldn't exist. And we discover something extraordinary in this passage. It's extraordinary in one way because it's uncomfortable. Why didn't Paul repudiate slavery when he had the opportunity? But what we really learn is something even more powerful, and that's this. The gospel, as it's truly understood, has the ability to function within the relationships that are found in a culture that aren't right. Let's think of a less offensive verse this way and get your heads around it. Back in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Paul tells wives to submit to your husbands. And then he tells husbands, husbands love your wives. Do you remember this, these verses? Right. Now, we don't find these offensive, but they're terribly offensive. They're just as offensive. I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. Some of you men are not worthy of being submitted to. Everybody's trying not to move. Fortunately, in the verse, Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands as long as they are the kind of man worth submitting to. Doesn't he say that? No, he doesn't. That's what's offensive. He's asking wives to submit to their husbands regardless of whether they earned their respect and submission. Same with men. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now it's getting serious. How did Christ love the church? He died for her in spite of the fact that she was not worthy of it. He's asking us as men, love your wife, right? When she's lovely and lovable and loving and doing all these lovely, lovable things, right? No, love your wife when she's not loving. When she's not worthy of being loved because of brokenness and sin and difficulty. See, what's he doing? He's asking us in our marriage to see the gospel so infuse us, so powerfully impact us, that I can submit to a guy who shouldn't be submitted to. And I can love a wife who is difficult to love. So he's, God, in, his, in the power of the gospel of redeeming us from our, sin, from our sin, can allow us to function in relationships that aren't whole yet. We can function in loving and mutually submissive marriages, not because our husbands and wives are worth being loved and submitted to, but because Jesus submitted to the Father on our behalf and loved us on our behalf, even though, even though we didn't deserve it. So the gospel allows us to function in Christ-like ways in relationships that aren't right yet. In the master-servant relationship, that's not a whole relationship. God never designed one party to be owned by another party. And Roman slavery at the time that this letter was written, about half of the population of the city of Rome was enslaved. Uh, and it was a matter of ownership. The fact that Paul is calling people to live within Paul condoning the nature of those relationships... Paul is not condoning slavery. He's saying within these broken relationships, live in the power of the gospel. To call people to life in imperfect realities, to be empowered by Christ, is not of the scripture condoning the realities of the situation. And the Bible is not condoning slavery or ownership of other humans. But he is calling those of us in imperfect relationships to be empowered by the gospel in the midst of it. To be empowered by the gospel in spite of the difficulty. So he calls a servants or slaves in this aspect to, to honor their owners, their masters with full respect. In spite of the fact that their masters may not deserve their respect. Over in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul touches on it in a letter to this same city, the Ephesians. The letter to the Ephesians. I'm going to read it because he's a little bit more comprehensive here. With his remarks, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. I'm going to read them. 
And you can follow along with me as I read. Slaves, obey your earthly matters, masters with respect and fear and sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor and when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Ephesians 6, 9. The one who is both your master, their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with God. There is no favoritism with God. Who does God prefer? No one. There is no favoritism with God. To live in the power of God and to live in relationship with others, to live in the power of God, in community with others, is to follow God's pattern which is found in the gospel. That is, to voluntarily set aside my agenda on behalf of another who may or may not be worthy of it. The power of the gospel in relationship, in the marriage relationship, in the master-slave relationship, in the community relationship, is for me to set aside my agenda on behalf of another one who may or may not deserve it. Did Jesus do that on the cross? Of course he did. Most profoundly, he set aside his own agenda, which is uninterrupted, perfect communion with the Father, on behalf of you, who had no communion with the Father. So he sets aside his own agenda on behalf of another who does not deserve it. So what is this respect, which he calls all of us to do? Full respect, and when that respect is missing, he says we are slandering God himself because we're not following God's pattern that is found in the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That respect is to see and understand and appreciate others in light of who Christ is and in light of the place they are. That respecting who Christ is and what, and what he did, and in light of the place where those people are. When Paul was challenging the servants, he was not saying, the masters ought to offer you respect, knowing that one day you could also be a master like them. How was he to, they were to show respect? For one another where they were, an understanding and an appreciation for the location, the context, the experience of that individual over and above my own experience, my own culture, my own context. This is where others look and see the situation of others and seek to understand it without condescension and without saying, I understand where you're at and where you're at and someday you'll be a lot better when you can get to where I'm at. This is where a majority culture in a country like ours, the majority culture in a country like ours, seeks intentionally to consider and understand and appreciate people who are not from their context, not from your situation, not from your locale or your background or your history, and not to do so in a condescending way as though, oh, I get it, because we don't. And not in an invitational way, which is to say, but that's okay, someday you will attain to majority culture status or achieve what the majority culture has. That's not the respect that Paul is calling for between master and servant here, and that's not the respect he's calling for between communities within the church, within, between individuals within a church, and in all relationships between individuals in the church and outside. It's a respect for understanding they are where they are. You are where you are. And an appreciation and understanding and an affirmation for the value of where they are, where someone else is. I 
I can't decide how, bad I want, how badly I'm going to offend you right now. Oh. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll, I'll start by saying this. Um, I am so close to turning Facebook off, and I hope many of you are too. Um, it has turned into a sewer of misinformation. Um, and I'm not denigrating. I like it because I get connects me with friends and family. Um, let me put it this way. As one who knows not what he talks about. Um, I've seen a lot of people concerned over the following phrase, and I want to use it as a diagnostic phrase to help settle our hearts on something critically important as we understand the gospel. Is It's this phrase, and this phrase is critically important. Black lives matter. And that has become a polarizing phrase in our culture. It has become a polarizing phrase that for some means one thing and for others mean another thing. For, for, for some people, they are, they are simply saying black lives matter too. Not to the exclusion of all the others, not to the exclusion of any others, but keep in mind, black lives matter too. And others would say, well, all lives matter. And Paul here in Ephesians chapter 6 is not whitewashing and asking anybody to walk away from their context and ignore their background and their history and their experience. He is saying we need to value and understand where others are from and the experience they are having with respect, not with condescension, with honor, not with I hope someday you get to get out of your situation and enjoy our situation. It's honor and respect for for the history and the context of an individual and valuing where their background has them. Some would say we, we, we just need to honor everyone and not focus on, on one uh, particular understanding of the difficulty some folks face. And I would just remind you of this. Notice in the story of the Good Samaritan, it's not the story of the good dude. Right? Jesus was intentionally making a point, drawing out of the individual experience of a particular group of people within a cultural context. And he was saying their experience is valid for consideration and understanding as the gospel is applied to their particular context and to your own. We must be very, very, very careful in seeking to uh, understand our own particular background that we don't irresponsibly disrespect the valid experience of many people in our cultures. Many people in their context. Why is this critically important? Because Paul says you risk slandering God if we uh, set aside with disrespect the legitimate and valid experience of others. We must acknowledge that some folks within a particular community experience marginalization in the culture itself. The church must be the ones on the forefront because we're empowered with the gospel to offer the greatest level of respect and affirmation and understanding for those who have experienced marginalization in our culture. Not in condescension. Not in shallow empathy as though we can, oh no, I get what your situation is. But rather with respect that affirms the situation and experiences Many have had. Some of the comments of I have heard coming out of the death of the two black men earlier this week and coming out of the deaths of the, pol- of the police uh, officers in Dallas have been nothing short. It's hateful. We run the risk when we're not willing to extend respect and affirmation to those not in our experience of slandering God. This isn't just an issue of trying to be multicultural or connect with others different than us. The point is the gospel allows us to have respect and affirmation for those who come from a different experience than us because Jesus did that for us. 
You know, Jesus' experience of life in eternity was not the same as ours. And he abandons his perfect life in eternity with the Father to seek to align himself perfectly to such a degree with ours that he could stand as our substitute. And it's not too much to ask, having experienced respect when it was undeserved, for us to extend it to others and say, you know what, there may be an experience different than mine that I need to think about. When we're not willing to extend our hearts and minds and empathy to those who come from a different background than us, we run the risk of slandering God. And let me just say, it's a false dichotomy here to say that we cannot respect the background and cultures of others while at the same time respecting the the valiant efforts of those in law enforcement. It's It's a false dichotomy. We can do both. We can, we can understand and appreciate and respect the, the cultural and historical background of people who come from a different background than ourselves while at the same time affirming bravery and heroism in a time of difficulty. It's a false dichotomy that's out there where you've you got to pick which team you want, you're on. I don't know if I made my point very well, but... At least I've said it. Um, I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Grave danger, slandering God, when we offer something other than respect and dignity to every human that's alive. Uh, Second grave danger, rejecting Jesus. First grave danger is slandering God, which is by not offering respect to those who ought to be respected. Secondly, uh, another grave danger is rejecting a Jesus. He starts in verse 3, anyone teaches false doctrines and doesn't agree to the sound instruction that is of Jesus Christ, he is conceited and understands nothing. He says people like this have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels and words that result in, in envy. You have these people who are so interested in, in parsing the minutia of uh, wives' tales and uh, superstitions and Bible trivia that they build nothing but controversies and quarrels and complaints within the community of believers. They've got their pet issues, which become their main issue. And uh, if their pet issue is not your main issue, they will quarrel with you and they will uh, complain to you and they will create controversies. This is individuals who have doctrinal tests on minor issues. Every now and then I'll get an email from somebody seeking to visit the church and they will ask about a a very minute minute doctrinal issue because that will be the, the, the litmus test as to whether or not they would fellowship in a place like ours. In Genesis chapter 6, Pastor, I don't know why people talk like that when they email me, but I know they're talking like that when they're typing. Just as chapter 6, are the angel, sons of men, or do you think those are angels or just really big, handsome dudes? Some of you aren't familiar with the passage. Well, gee, I, uh, we've been working on that issue now for about 4,500 years since it was written. Nobody's really settled on it, but now I need to offer definitive proof of that we're on the right side of history on whether or not those people were angels or just big, handsome dudes. That's, that's creating a, a, a doctrinal test on a minor issue that doesn't matter. Or, or someone who spends enormous amounts of time with broad learning on a side issue that's insignificant. Another, another way that these folks are described is those who uh, are, are complaining. that They're creating a strife and malicious talk within the community of believers. I'm going to let you in on a secret about church. There's always something to complain about. Right? There's always something. Why is that? Well, just the one reason. We're not in heaven yet. When we're in heaven, there will be nothing to complain about, and that will drive us nuts. We'll fill out comment cards in heaven. You know, really it would be nice if there was something to complain about. Throw a guy a bone. These are people who leverage their knowledge and their power and their influence primarily in, in areas of teaching and doctrine or, or concern that are side issues and minor issues in order to gain influence and power within a, a body of believers. They're parsing words and they're, they're seeking, there's constant friction and they've been robbed of the truth. They think godliness is a way of just getting money or power. 
I want to reframe how we think a little bit about life in the body of Christ in the world around us. Life in the body of Christ in the world around us ought to be compared uh, not so much to having coffee at Starbucks. Uh, really, it's more like being in a trench in World War I. One author t- uh, says it this way about the Christian life before the return of Christ, which is now. We ought to have a warfare mentality. We must understand we're in the enemy's territory and he's trying to destroy us. And it's with that mentality that we can approach the concerns and the things around us. You can imagine the World War I soldier sitting there talking with his buddy. He says, you know, I've had it. I'm going to see the CO. Yeah, what are you doing? That, I'm, I'll take care of it. So he marches down the trench, gets to his CO. He said, listen, buddy. You know, we've got to march up and down these trenches all day long. There's a couple of things we could use. Number one, can we get the water out? It's muddy. I have to scrub my boots every night because of the mud. And secondly, the surface is really uneven. My left ankle, it kind of bums me out. I'm walking and the surface, is, what would the CEO say to that guy? <laughs> You're taking lead on the next, uh, next march out. Now, now, is it to say, would it be nice if there was no mud in the trench and the, in the shirt? Yeah, that would be nice. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing, you know, but, but the idea is in that moment, in the moment of warfare and conflict where the enemy is seeking to, to destroy them, why is this the concern? And when we have a warfare mentality, it doesn't mean that what we see and understand isn't true and real. It's just we, we put it in light of where we're at. Okay, is that really a big, as big of an issue as I think it is? A culture of complaint in our own hearts or in a church has completely missed the cross. A culture of complaint in our own hearts or in the heart of a church is an indication we've completely missed the cross. Because when we look to the cross, that really shines a light on our concerns. And some concerns need to be aired and addressed and dealt with. But oftentimes we can look to the cross and say, you know what? No big deal. Rejecting Jesus is most profoundly seen in a community of believers functioning in relationship when instead of having a culture of grace, we find a culture of complaint. It's an indication, a warning. We have rejected the application of the cross in our hearts. Grave danger, slandering God, rejecting Jesus by living in a community that's not marked by healthy relationships informed by the love of Christ, but instead are marked in the way that it is described. Envy, strife, malicious talk, suspicions, constant friction. These are indications that our concerns for our personal preferences have trumped the work of Christ on the cross. Grave danger, slandering God, second, rejecting Jesus, third, forsaking heaven, forsaking heaven. Verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Grave danger is forsaking heaven. Paul calls here the people of the church to seek great gain. Paul wants us as believers to gain the most we possibly can, and he tells us how to do it. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If you went to your financial planner and he said, I can guarantee you significant gains on your investment, what would your response be? Sign me up. Oh, that's exactly what Paul has said here. He has said, understand, godliness with contentment is great gain. It's a guarantee, it's it's an investment that will never go bad, that we gain more than we could possibly imagine when we find godliness and contentment is the pattern of our life. What is godliness? 
addressing our relationship with God and relationship with others in the pattern we have described. Mutual love, mutual respect, and understanding that God has made a way for us to achieve righteousness through Christ alone and not through our deeds alone. Godliness is acknowledging God is our goal and our source. And that is only achieved through Jesus Christ himself. What is contentment? Very simple. God is enough. Contentment is simply in faith, understanding if you have gained God, you have gained enough. Have you gained God through faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross? Then, then uh, that's a, a real understanding. Then I've got all I need. I don't need anything else. Jesus described it this way in a couple of short parables in the book of Matthew. One is a guy walking across the field, and he discovers a great treasure. And what does he do? Because he's a smart guy. He makes sure that nobody else can see the treasure. He hides it. And then he goes to the guy who owns the field, and what does he do there? I'll buy your field for him, from you. And the guy who's selling the field says, well, well gee, I, you know, I want 100000 bucks." And the guy, all I've got is a couple of quarters. He said, but hold on. Sit tight. So the guy then goes, do you know, what he, do you know the story? What's he do? He sells everything. He sells everything. He doesn't have anything left. He liquefies his entire portfolio, all of his assets. He turns into cash, and he comes out with $100,000 exactly. Okay, I'm adding to the story to make it connect. You understand. So he goes to the guy, here's my $100,000. Now, why would he do that? Because what is in the field is worth more than the $100,000. Now, if that field was worth $2 million, and your buddy had this happen to you, he said, listen, yeah, I could have sold everything about the field, but... You know, I didn't think it was worth it. What would you say to your buddy? You'd be nice, something like, you're a moron. You're going to turn $100,000 into $2 million? What is wrong with you? There's something wrong with you. Well, this is exactly Jesus' point in the parable. What is wrong with you that you're seeking something worth so little when you can abandon it and get something worth so much? The reason money is so captivating to us is because God is not very big. And he's not worth a whole lot. And that's what Paul is calling us to here. Is to understand the value. We have gained God. There is nothing else we could gain that will ever come close. Godliness is understanding the pattern of relationship between God and us and ourselves and others. And contentment is knowing that God is enough. There is nothing here in this world that you will want there. There's nothing here that you will want in heaven. I'll put it another way. Think of your your best possession. And I know the people in my life are my greatest treasure. I know. Now think of your best physical possession. Maybe it's your car. I don't know. Um, Maybe it's a a shirt you really like. Guys, you have that one shirt that you just love it when it's clean. Oh, yes. Love that shirt. No? None of you guys? Okay. Now it's embarrassing. Um, n- neither do I. But, but a guy told me. Uh, maybe it's your house. Maybe it's your retirement. Maybe you've got a, a nice nest egg. You worked most, most of your life to save up for it, and, uh, and now you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. You know you've got money to go, money to spare for the rest of your life. What's your greatest possession? When you're in heaven, if you were handed that possession, you would drop it in disgust. It would be so gross there. You say, why why would anybody even want to waste a second looking at this? Get it out of here. There is nothing here that we will even want there. And, And Paul is simply calling us in faith to live in that reality here. To live today as though that were true because it is true. Now, of course, it's terribly, terribly difficult because this is the reality we live in. But this is what he's calling us to do is say, is there is nothing here I'm going to want there and I'm going to treat it lightly living here.
to seek to be satisfied with money or with the things of this world seeks to say, I want heaven now, and I think I can have an experience of heaven here in this place. It undervalues the glory we have to look forward to, and it overvalues the stuff here, and it's a terrible, terrible danger that we might forsake the glories of heaven for temporary satisfaction here, and it is temporary satisfaction, isn't it? Of course it is. You saved and you saved and you bought that thing. I don't know what it might have been for you. For me, it was a new sewing machine. I'm kidding, it wasn't. I have no idea how to sew. You say, and you get it, and it's awesome, and you're excited, and you get the butterflies, it's so cool. And then you play with it, and you ignore your family for like a week. I don't know what it is, everybody has their own thing, but you're like, your family, you're like, who are you? Get away from me. Honey, get these kids out of here. I'm messing with my new thing. And then like two weeks later, you're like, meh, this is all right. I mean, isn't that the universal experience? That never ends. That Rockefeller said, how much more money do you want? You know the quote. What do he say? It's one more dollar. This is where it all goes. And we have to understand that. We have to acknowledge that. And hold loosely to the things of this world, knowing heaven will be so much better. Contentment is to say, you know what? I'm all right. Heaven's coming. My experience here isn't my final experience. It's there. What I was made to be, the person I was made to be, and the work I was made to do is primarily there. Most of your existence will be lived there. What you were called to, what you were built for. Have you ever lived in this world feeling like it, you just didn't fit? And it was C.S. Lewis who said, that's because something in you is reminding you, you weren't built for here. There is something coming you were made for, something so profound that you would be happy to spend eternity doing it. Has anything in this world ever moved you with that, with that? Nothing here can do that. Even if you got your dream job, at some point you still say this in the morning, I'm going to what? Work. No one says in the morning, I'm going to vacation. At some point, there will be toil, there will be drudgery, there will be difficulty, even in the dream job. Because we were called for something bigger. Do we want to seek what we desire? Then we're seeking heaven here. Do we want to seek for our rights here and fight for our rights here? We've forgotten all of our rights and freedoms are going to be experienced there. Do we want to air our complaints here? Or rather say, you know what, heaven's coming, I'll be okay. I can put up with this irritation, heaven's coming. James 4, verses 1 through 3, I'm going to read it and we're going to sum everything up after I read this. Here's what it says in James 4, 1 through 3. It's a verse many of you are familiar with, so you can listen or follow along. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. In 99% of conflict and quarrels, either in the home or in the church or in the community, it's because something wants, somebody wants something, and they will not let it go. Those who have a hope that is not here, but is there, much easily let go and say, no, I'm good without it. The quarrels, they fall away. We think quarrels and fighting will go away when finally, at some point, they will get that I'm right. Right? I know you would never say that out loud to your husband or your wife. We will stop fighting when they finally figure out I'm right on this. You will stop fighting when you stop needing to be right on that. In the church, we will stop fighting when we stop needing what we want. And some of those desires are deep, and some of those have profound historical reasons and profound uh, personal reasons in your own heart. But the fight will not stop 
when everybody finally figures out you're right. The fight will stop when we figure out we don't need to be right because heaven is coming and it ain't here. I don't need to be right. Heaven's coming. I don't need what I prefer. Heaven is coming. Complaints and fights don't go away when we finally just get a church that's filled with a bunch of people who all like the same stuff. First of all, that's not a church empowered by the gospel. The world can do that. It's called the Elks Lodge. The gospel says we're going to do something profoundly different and powerful. A bunch of people who have disparate backgrounds and different histories and different preferences and different ages and uh, different desires can all get together and say Jesus is coming. Now that's a powerful gospel movement in a community of believers. A bunch of believers finally taking a vote and agreeing on something because 60% got their way is not gospel empowered. It's might makes right. The world can do that. They do it every day. A gospel-empowered church is when 60% or 80% say, we don't want it our way. The minority can have it their way. A guy named uh, Chapman, I forget his first name. R.C. Chapman, thank you, Daryl. His church grew. It was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And a small minority of the people didn't like R.C. Chapman. He had a big beard. There were suspicions he was hiding things in his beard. It came to a vote, and the majority of the people in his church agreed that he would stay as pastor, and the people who had come to know the Lord, had come as a result of his ministry, could stay in the building. And do you know what he did? They signed the building over to the minority and left, and they leased space, because he said, that's what the gospel does. 80% don't win, the gospel wins when those who have the power give it up. We forsake heaven when we think we want what we need here, whether it be money, whether it be our desires, whether it be our preferences, whatever it might be, when we need something so bad here, we have forsaken heaven because we think we need a sense of heaven here. When we know heaven is coming, we don't need anything here. We're good. Grave danger, slandering God. A couple of comments and questions to ask yourself. When we look at the cross and see Jesus on the cross suffering for all who would receive him, how do we think he feels about the people that we disrespect? There are people in your mind that you have no regard for. It's the human condition. So if you're saying, no, I don't, I don't know, you need to think a little harder. A part of repentance is calling a spade a spade. There are people in your mind you have no regard for. It may not be a race issue. It may be a a financial issue. It may be a work issue. It may be a background issue. I don't know. But there are people in your mind that you do not have regard for. How do you think Jesus feels about that on the cross as he's bleeding for that person? Jesus died for people different than me. Jesus died for people from different backgrounds than you. Jesus didn't die to make people like us. He died to make people like him. One last thing on this, and then I'll move on. Slandering God is um, have an understanding here. Heaven will not look like Western Christian America. It it just, it's not going to look that way. If we just want to talk about what it's going to be like, if we just take a historical, broad-based look at the last 2,000 years of church history, we're the small part. When we get to glory, number one, we'll finally appreciate the beauty that God has been working in the tapestry of all of human history, not just our history. And secondly, we can understand that that Jesus didn't do a work so that we could make people Christian Americans. He did a work so he could make people like Jesus. And people can be a lot like Jesus and not like you and me. And it's not shameful. It's, in fact, beautiful. 
and it's respectful, and it's glorious. And we slander God when he says, when we think that, that all Christians should be like us. Rather, we should acknowledge the fact that most Christians aren't like us. Secondly, rejecting Jesus. When we complain, I just want to remind ourselves that nothing will ever be perfect and right here. There's always something. Is there a place to uh, provide feedback and let somebody know that something's going on that needs to be addressed? Absolutely. It's not what we're talking about. But to have a culture of complaint where nothing is ever okay, where we can finally just say, you know what, we're good. It misses the cross and misses the work of Christ, which does not create a culture of complaint. He creates a culture of grace, where he says, in spite of all the imperfections and difficulties, we're good. I receive you. You receive me. We receive one another and the community he has given us. Third danger, forsaking heaven. The question you have to ask yourself, is God enough? If left to just you and God, would you be good? And the call of the Apostle Paul to our hearts is to affirm that the contentment is found in saying God is enough. If you're like me, you have to admit that's not even close to true. But we can seek that God's work is being done in us. So, I don't know. I don't want to make you too uptight. But here, let me give you some good news. If you, have, having read this passage or heard my comments today, you say, you know what? I, you know, a couple of those dangers, maybe two out of three for me. I do slander God by disrespecting others. I, yeah. I, I do reject the grace of Christ by nitpicking, complaining, and letting stuff that I want hold on to so tightly. I, I do forsake heaven because I'm seeking my way in this world. And, and, and maybe you acknowledge that with me, that many of these things, if not all of these things, you see them happening in your life. And the good news is there is grace for us today. There is grace for those who have slandered God. There is grace for those who have forsaken heaven. Those, there are grace for those who have, in our actions and attitudes, set Jesus aside this week. Jesus comes in and says, no, I got, I got you. And he calls us, though, to acknowledge, knowing his grace is there, acknowledge, God, I need you to change my heart. I need you to change how I look at the people around me and the communities around me. I need you to change how I watch the news. I need you to change how I view the community of believers, my church. I need you, God, to change how I view my material possessions. What do we call that when we say, God, I want you to change me? Big fancy word. It's called repentance. Say, God, I don't want to be like this anymore. I want to be like Jesus. Do something in my heart. I want to be like Christ, but I'm not like Christ. Show me your grace by changing me even today. Jesus on the cross, you do understand, he paid for your slander because he was slandered. He paid for your rejection because he was what? He was rejected. He paid for your forsaking him because he was forsaken. He can handle it and offers us grace and mercy new even in this moment. Let's stand up for a minute. I want to give you a chance to come to him in prayer before we close with a chorus.